I present my interpretation of already established arguments. If an error is made, it's most likely an oversight committed by me. Marx's theory sees many criticisms. Many criticisms are presented in undecipherable methods, mostly to laymen. Go through the Wikipedia article on the transformation problem, and the average leftist will just opportunistically become a valley form theorist or ignore the issue. It's hard to blame them. Critics, even ignorant critics, will still use these historic criticisms to bludgeon Marx. This video will provide tables wherever possible for the sake of understanding. Once the equivocation is stripped, intellectual bankruptcy is ultimately revealed. When academic debate doesn't go your way, it is ridiculously easy to play dirty. You can publish videos and effectively move the discourse towards a core of public opinion. Paul Kaksha and Dave Zachariah had found this to be a viable strategy. Andrew Kleiman and the TSSI have gained bizarrely negative images within leftist circles. When critics are ultimately questioned, they state, I heard bad things about it, or link Kokshat's YouTube video. These critics are mass-produced through ignorance and petty sophistry. It follows that the ignorance and sophistry must be fought. Refuting myths of internal inconsistency as a basic process will have to spread towards more communicative information mediums to have an impact on discourse. This video is part of the process. Is Karl Marx allowed to have his own theory? This may seem like a silly question. However, declaring something invalid without justifiable cause ultimately destroys integrity. Understanding and insight are substituted for opportunism and misrepresentation. Said more clearly, fixing Marx for intuitive reasons is effectively barring his theory from competing with revisions and alternative approaches. But what is Marx's theory then? There's Marx's essence and his argument. Determining essence collapses into relativism without guidelines or proper procedure. There's no definition and there's no explication. Many Marxists claim to represent many aspects of Marx's theory under the guise of them understanding the essence and intentions held by Marx, yet they blatantly ignore Marx's conclusions and actual demonstrations. This is problematic and a ruse to call their own stuff Marx's. Temporal single system interpretation theorists understand that arbitrariness withstands science. The principle of scientific exegesis is ultimately adopted for this reason. The principle of scientific exegesis readily affirms, unless the premises lead to the conclusions, unless internal cohesiveness is achieved, the interpretation is unsound when other interpretations can achieve cohesiveness. Anyone can misinterpret premises to break from conclusions, meanwhile achieving cohesiveness is a true test of interpretive adequacy. Maximum likelihood estimation is a statistical technique in which one works backwards, beginning with the results, the sample data. It uses them to infer the mathematical relationship between the variables that exist in the larger population. The relationship one selects is the one that is most likely to have produced the observed data. The principle of scientific exegesis is an application of criterion of coherence in two senses. First, it proposes that interpretations be tested according to whether they can establish coherence between two different aspects of a text definitions and premises on the one hand, conclusions on the other. Second, it requires a holistic rather than a linear method of reading a theoretical text. It denies that the meaning of an author's premises and definitions can be determined by focusing solely on passages that discuss them directly. It thereby also implicitly denies that one can judge whether a work is internally coherent by determining whether its conclusions follow from an interpretation of its premises and definitions that was worked out prior to and without regard to the conclusions. The meaning of the premises is instead established when an interpretation is able to take passages that contain conclusions and passages that set out premises and make them cohere with one another. Value theory seeks to explain capitalism cohesively. Capitalism's origins, capitalism's contradictions, capitalism's antagonisms, and capitalism's tendencies. It follows that the observer current crises which prevail under capitalist production should be under the purview of Marx's value theory. Marx's value theory handled this dilemma. Tendential drops in a rate of profit sufficiently explained capitalist crises. Crises and not collapse was the explication's ultimate scientific proposition. The quote starts here. When Adam Smith explains the fall in the rate of profit as stemming from the superabundance of capital, he is speaking of a permanent effect in this wrong. As against this, the transitory superabundance of capital, overproduction and crises are something different. Permanent crises do not exist. End quote. Side note, all internal and consistent theories are wrong by definition. What happens when somebody proves existing inconsistency within Marx's theory of crises? Incredible controversy. 
Nobuo Kishio sought to prove just that, internal consistency within Marxist theory. Did he succeed? Apparently, yes. Robert Brenner, the noted Marxist historian, was able to dispose of the law of the tendential fall and the rate of profit in a single footnote of a 265-page work on economic crises and stagnation. He simply invoked the Okishio theorem and, for good measure, common sense. Start quote. Marx's theory of the fall of the rate of profit flies in the face of common sense. For if, as Marx himself seemed to take for granted, capitalists adopt technical changes that raise their own rate of profit, it seems intuitively obvious that the ultimate result of their innovation can only be to raise the average rate of profit. Formal proofs of this result can be found in Nobuo Kishio as well as in John Romer. A recent dismissal is that of Hachnell, a radical economist. Start quote. Despite a number of attempts by diehard Marxists during the 1970s and 1980s to rescue the falling rate of profit crises theory from being relegated to the dustbin of history by the Kishio theorem, by the end of the century, virtually all open-minded political economists recognized that the supposed internal contradiction within capitalism had been nothing more than a lengthy intellectual red herring." End quote. Howard and King claimed, start quote, to reassert in the face of the Akishio theorem and related demonstrations, the relevance of the falling rate of profit, as analyzed by Marx, has done much damage to the intellectual credentials of Marxian political economy." End quote. We have a dilemma. Marx after Akishio. Is it even possible? We have already touched on scientific exegesis and understanding Marx. What is the cohesive interpretation solution? What does the TSSI propose? The following is ultimately proposed. A. Valuation is temporal, so input and output prices can differ. B. Values and prices, though quite distinct, are determined interdependently. These theses may seem pedantic and highly irrelevant, but A. Marx explicitly supported them, and B. Without these clarifications, value theory can be severely broken. Look at this table. Now, how is the value of inputs ultimately really determined? Since Marx often stressed that a commodity's value depends on the amount of labor currently needed to reproduce it, not the amount of labor actually used to produce it, the replacement cost interpretation initially appears plausible, if not compelling. However, newly produced and previously produced commodities are knowledge to have values that solely reflect current socially necessary labor time by both the temporal single system interpreters and simultaneous critics. The question is, how are current commodity values determined? Pre-production reproduction values determine the cost, claim Marx and temporal single system interpreters. Start quote. The maximum loss of value the means of production can suffer in the process is plainly limited by the amount of the original value of which they entered into it. A means of production cannot transfer any value to the product unless it possess value before its entry into the process. End quote. All materials and means of labor start quote, add to the labor time containing the product only as much labor time as they themselves contain before the production process. End quote. Marx held that the production process results in start quote, the preservation of the amount of labor already objectified in use of means of production and thus preserves the previously existing value of the capital. End quote. And a final quote is start quote, the difference between prices of production and value is incorporated into the value of the new commodity as a presupposed element. End quote. Here we have a basic seed corn economy, as demonstrated by Marx, where corn is used to produce more corn. So we see that each sum on the table has both a monetary value expressed in pounds and a physical quantity expressed in quarters. So the input price of the first year is two pounds per quarter. We see the corn going through the production process. The output is 200 pounds in monetary terms and 100 quarters in physical terms. We see that the output price is two pounds per quarter. Of course, we divide the monetary value by the physical sum. And we see that the rate of profit at the end of this year is 66.7% for the, for the monetary terms and also 66.7% in terms of physical quantities. So the second year is almost the same, but not quite. So in the second year, the input price is two pounds per quarter. That is to be expected as the output price of the previous year is also two pounds per quarter. But we see it going through the production process and there's a slight change. There's a change in productivity. So whereas for the last year, there was 200 pounds of monetary terms corresponding to 100 
quarters in physical output. Now there is 200 pounds in monetary terms corresponding to 200 pounds of physical output. And we see that the per unit price here has decreased to one pound per quarter. We get that by dividing by, uh, the monetary sum by the physical quantity, right? But what is there to be learned from this? There's a very distinct and important lesson here. And it's that the input price, as is demonstrated by Marx in this table, is not revalued at the output price. There's no replacement cost valuation. We see that the input price is still two pounds per quarter, while the output price is one pound per quarter. And they are distinct categories. And we see over here that the rate of profit in monetary terms is still 66.7%. This is to be expected as, of course, the organic composition in monetary terms did not change at all. The physical rate of profit skyrocketed to 233%, but through our Marxist lens, we're not really concerned with that. That's for physicalists. Combining Marx's explicit temporalist evaluation and its textual support for temporalist evaluation, the case is ultimately very transparent. The path is ultimately really clear for reconstructing a theory of crises using Marx's premises. But is replacement cost input valuation more logical? Does it guide capital investment and profit seeking? Well, not really, no. Andrew Kleinman says in his book, start quote, Capitalists employ measures because what they seek, must seek, to maximize is the rate of self-expansion of their value, not the rate of self-expansion of use value that the material rate, i.e. the physical rate of profit measures. Consider a firm that produces computers by means of computers. Computer prices plummet markedly year by year. In computing its potential profit rate, only the naivest firm would overlook or be indifferent to the fact that a unit of its output will be worth less than a unit of its input, physically identical though they may be." End quote. Look at this spreadsheet. All three data tables represent the same data. All output is reinvested. This is a seed core model. Feel free to pause the video to absorb all of the variable names information. It's a lot to take in, but this is how we disprove a Kisho 3 demonstration. In the first year, we see 320 units of value transferred and 80 units of value added in production, and this sums up to an output value of 400. We see that there's a 25% rate of profit. Now in the next year, 20% more labor is employed. This increases both physical output and the living labor involved in the process. So the physical output increases by 4% pieces and the value added increases by 20 units in year 2. In the third year, productivity increases. This means that the living labor employed stays the same, while physical output increases. By the end of the third year, each physical unit contains only 3.33 units of value, so all of the value transferred is additionally revalued at the replacement cost, which is 3.33. So while the output of the second year was 500 units of value, that got retroactively revalued to 333 units of value. Another productivity increase in year 4 does the same. In the table on the right, the starting conditions and productivity increases are the same. However, since we're using Marx's premises here, inputs aren't retroactively revalued at replacement costs in year 3 and 4. The absence of this revaluation process means that we're not snapping value out of existence anymore. As a result, we see the organic composition rise as the value added stays the same while the value transfer keeps growing. The rate of profit declines in the third and fourth years as a result, despite there being technological change. It is clear through this demonstration that Akisha was only able to maintain his results through his employment of simultaneous valuation. Once that is dropped, Marx is completely vindicated. David Lehman and Duncan Foley claim that within the TSSI framework, material profit rates predict trends within value profit rates. Duncan Foley specifically claimed that the profit rates do not diverge really asymptotically. David Lehman proposed a tracking theorem critique, where the value rate of profit follows a trend set by the material profit rate. Andrew Kleiman replied with start quote, What do not diverge asymptotically means is that there is a maximum amount by which the two rates will differ. For instance, if rising productivity growth causes the physical rate of profit to rise from 25% to a maximum level 50%, while causing the value slash price rate of profit to fall from 25% to a minimum level of 0%, the two rates have not diverged asymptotically. It is extremely difficult to see how this result, which is in any case specific to Foley's example, can possibly be construed as confirmation of the notion that the physical rate of profit governs the value search price rate, much less as a confirmation of the Akishio theorem. If the physical rate of profit rises forever, while the value rate of profit falls forever, the value rate is certainly not following the trend of the physical rate, not even eventually. David Lehman and Duncan Foley had significant concessions to make in the end. 
David Lehman claimed, start quote, if a viable technical change is made and the real wage rate is constant, the new material rate of profit must be higher than the old one. That is all that Akishio or Romer or Foley or I or anyone else has ever claimed, end quote. Duncan Foley claimed, start quote, I understand Freeman and Kleiman to be arguing that Akishio's theme as literally stated is wrong because it is possible for the money and labor rates of profit to fall under the circumstances specified in hypothesis. I accept their examples as establishing this possibility." End quote. Roberto Veneziani claimed that the temporal single system interpretation depends crucially upon impossible scenarios. His first claim is that climate ignores inflation in his models. Let us look at climate's conception of inflation for a better understanding of what the discussion is about. Climate claims start quote, In a real world, of course, we have experienced an almost continual rise in prices for many decades, despite the fact that increasing productivity has caused commodities values, measured in terms of labor time or a constant monetary expression of labor time, to decline. In other words, the monetary expression of labor time does not remain constant, but rises systematically. It is tempting to assume that this phenomenon negates the law for the tendential fall in the rate of profit, at least in the sense that the nominal price rate of profit must rise, not fall, when prices are continually increasing. If this is not the case, imagine that in a corn economy, the price of corn rises by 10% year after year. This year's output sells for 10% more than it would have sold for last year. The seed corn advance at the start of the year also costs 10% more than it would have cost last year. The rate of profit, the ratio of sales revenue to costs, minus one, is consequently the same whether we use this year's or last year's input and output prices to value the seed corn and output. In other words, inflation leaves the rate of profit unchanged if the rate of inflation remains constant. What affects the rate of profit is therefore not inflation per se, but changes in the rate of inflation. A rising rate of inflation causes sales revenue to increase by a greater percentage than costs increase, thus the nominal rate of profit rises. Conversely, when the rate of inflation is falling, sales revenue increases by a smaller percentage than costs, causing the nominal rate of profit to fall. What matters is not whether prices are rising or falling, that is, whether the rate of inflation is positive or negative, but whether the rate of inflation is rising or falling. Hence, productivity growth need not lead to deflation, falling prices, in order to cause the nominal rate of profit to fall. It needs to lead to disinflation, a falling rate of inflation. If this occurs, then the nominal rate of profit, just like the real value rate, must fall in relationship to the physical rate of profit, regardless of whether prices are rising or falling. Unless the physical rate rises by an amount sufficient to offset this effect, both the nominal and the real value rates of profit will decline in absolute terms as well. The point can also be expressed in the following way. A rising melt does not cancel out the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. It is easy to show that the rate of inflation is approximately equal to the growth rate of the melt, or monetary expression of labor time, plus the growth rate of the values. Thus, if the melt grows at a constant rate, but values fall at an increasing rate as a result of rising rate of productivity growth, the rate of inflation must decline. The nominal rate of profit will tend to fall. It is, of course, possible in principle that the growth rate of the melt will accelerate, canceling out or more than canceling out this effect. However, there is no inherent reason that it should do so. A rising melt reflects built-in or exogenous inflation, inflation that arises because of factors other than productivity growth. Here is the temporalist value search price rate of profit, given the value and the 20% annual growth of the monetary expression of labor time. A quick disclaimer for the table. New value, or NV, is the sum of units popped into existence by inflation and surplus value. So we have in the first year 320 units of capital advance and 80 units produced. The 80 is multiplied by 1.2 and the 320 is multiplied by 1.2. Then the sum of that total value is found at the end of the year and the sum is 480. Meanwhile, 80 times 1.2 minus 80 and 320 times 1.2 minus 320 are added as part of the new value in that year, which is 160. So we have the original 80 surplus value plus the 80 units popped into existence by inflation. The same process goes for all the years. Regardless, we see that the rate of profit is decreasing as there is a decreasing rate of inflation. The second claim is that Kleiman assumes that labor input converges to zero. Kleiman responded to this with the following paragraph, start quote, Although Veneziani calls this case implausible, any other assumption implies that labor productivity cannot increase beyond a certain point. 
if, for example, the amount of labor needed to produce a unit of output continually falls over time from 1,000 hours to 1 hour, but cannot decline any further, then an hour of labor can never yield more than one unit of output. Not now, not at any time in the future. It seems to me that this is an implausible singular case. There is certainly no evidence that the level of aggregate productivity has ever run up against such an insurmountable barrier." End quote. Paul Cockshaw and Dave Zachariah have constructed a few large criticisms. These criticisms are simply terrible. They depend on obfuscated graphs and are highly misrepresentative. Here's Cockshaw's daddy simulation. What does Cockshaw simulate? He simulates a long period without technical progress. Doing so simply kills the barrier that separates the temporalist valuation and simultaneous valuation. No wonder that this Raphaean and TSSI profit rates ultimately converge. TSSI authors have consistently made clear that the temporal rate of profit doesn't converge to the static equilibrium rate of profit when there's continuous technological change as there is in reality. It is not true that they only look at immediate changes, they look at the whole trajectory of change. What they don't do is compel technological change to cease. Kleiman says, start quote, in his presentation of the law, Marx analyzes the fall in prices resulting from productivity growth at considerable length. Moreover, the law clearly assumes continuous technological progress, a factor that continually counteracts any tendency of input prices and output prices to equalize, end quote. Cockshaw claimed that Kleiman uses profit rate equalization. However, Andrew Kleiman never claimed that the profit rate ultimately equalizes previous corn examples simply depended upon organic composition. Because Kleiman made his point very apparent, Cockshaw made an additional argument. Cockshaw claimed that Kleiman's theory without equalization becomes indeterminate. However, Andrew Kleiman's price theory doesn't resemble Ptolemy's epicycles. There's no basis for arbitrarily setting profit rates. There's no call for arbitrarily setting profit rates. Because you can fudge doesn't mean that the models fudge. Profit rates are determined through organic composition and possible deviations, and setting numbers arbitrarily remains completely noticeable. The third claim is that the monetary expression of labor time is undetermined. However, the temporalist monetary expression of labor time is by definition equal to the economy-wide ratio of the total money price of output to the total labor time of output. So there are two unknowns, the monetary expression of labor time and the nominal price level. If one thinks that the nominal price level is not determined by the monetary expression of labor time, but by other processes, those that cause inflation such as deflation, then the issue is that, to know the value of the monetary expression of labor time, one first needs to know the nominal price level, and to know the nominal price level, one needs to know the nominal prices of individual commodities. But Marx's value theory, not the TSSI, Marx's own original theory, says nothing about how nominal prices are determined. In the general case, I'm not talking about special cases in which the nominal prices are strictly in inverse proportion to the labor time value of gold. That's not surprising. It's a theory of the determination of value, not of nominal price. It's not an oversight on Marx's part. If there's any theory of value whatsoever, neoclassical, classical seraphine, that produces a determinate nominal price level or a determinate set of nominal prices, I'm not aware of that. So the undetermined monetary expression of labor time criticism is really just a disguised criticism of Marx's own value theory for not providing determinate nominal prices, while exempting from the criticism all competitor theories which also do not provide determinate nominal prices. Akisho's theorem has been attacked prior to the TSSI. None of these attacks ultimately succeeded. Assumptions of constant real wage rates remain often attacked. Raising real wage rates declines profit due to reasons unconnected with productivity. Marx's whole entire thesis is that the organic composition declines profits. Other points similarly only prove that profit is able to decline along, not because of increased productivity growth. This is the end of my presentation on how the TSSI dissolves Okishio's theorem and refutes a central point that is used to bludgeon Marx's theory with the charge of internal inconsistency. I might produce a presentation on the transformation problem in the future, which is a separate, although similarly easy matter to handle. I thoroughly recommend Andrew Clement's book, Reclaiming Marx's Capital, where every argument is given thorough care and where there is lots more to learn than what I could fit into here.